Hello, respective viewers. I'm George from Ireland. Behind me, you see the house where Violet Bonham Carter spent much of her middle age and her dotage. I'm in London on Gloucester Square. So Violet Bonham Carter was uh, one of the most prominent figures in the Liberal Party from the 1930s to her death in 1969. Um, she was born in 1887 and her father um, uh, was Henry Herbert Asquith, later Liberal Prime Minister, um, so 1908 to 1916. Uh, he was from a prominent Yorkshire business family and became a barrister. But on to, on to Violet, one of his several children. Uh, she was only four when her mother died and then her father uh, remarried uh, Margot, who was much younger than himself. She was um, strong-willed, and so was Violet Bonham Carter, obstinate in her own way, and the two uh, were not in sympathy, frequently crossed swords, but she did acknowledge that her, her stepmother was dedicated to her father, and then H. H. Hasquith was, was uxorious in equal measure. Um, so Violet uh, grew up in Hampstead, so a Hampstead liberal. That's a part of North London said to be infested by liberals and socialists. Uh, but uh, she went to the countryside quite a lot as well. She didn't go to school, uh, even uh, you know, although for the, for the aristocrats that was quite common, girls anyway, by that stage, but not for the upper middle class like she was. Um, anyway, so she had governesses coming to her, giving her lessons at home. So. Uh, what she couldn't learn from these um, preceptors, she was going to learn in person in terms of languages, spending time in Paris and Dresden, where she uh, acquired French and, uh, and German. Um, anyway, so she left school, and I don't know what she did, just one of those super ladies about town, uh, a liberal activist going to, to, to political meetings, believing that um, women should have the right to vote, which her father didn't agree with at first. So she got to know Winston Churchill, who was a Liberal Member of Parliament from 1904 to 22. Of course, had been a Conservative prior to that, and was a Conservative then again, having briefly tried to be a one-man band as a constitutionalist and anti-socialist. But um, uh, that, that idea was put paid to at the, at the Westminster by-election. So she was very close to uh, Winston Churchill, who, and she had the hots for him, but he didn't quite fancy her quite as much. Um, and she was aghast when he um, got engaged to Clementine Hosier. They later took a, they took a holiday in Scotland together in North Britain. That's um, Violet uh, Asquith, as she then was, and Winston Churchill. So, so Churchill was, was plighted to, to um, Clementine by this stage, and his fiance almost broke off the, the engagement over that because it felt like infidelity before the marriage had even begun. I'm not saying that they got into bed together, but there were clearly feelings on both sides. Anyway, the First World War broke out. She proved through herself into, into pro-war activism. Her father was, of course, the Prime Minister who advised George V to proclaim a war on the Second Reich, and indeed he did. Uh, the trouble is the Liberal Party didn't think it was as anti-Liberalism. It was with the Defense of the Realms Act, as in uh, censorship, um, compulsory purchase of things, banning people from possessing certain items, particular maps, binoculars, and so forth, forbidding people to feed human food to dogs, not allowing people to treat in pubs and to buy alcohol for others, eventually conscription, and on and on and on. So greater state control, when liberalism is supposed to be casting off, it's supposed to be about casting off the shackles of the individual. Um, and it was meant to be a liberal cause war. So really, the United Kingdom was, was lined up with the Russian Empire. Anyway, so the UK came out of that through the Arabs. And at last, she later married Bond, who was known as the Queen's Private Secretary. So they went on to have two daughters and two sons in that order. Um, there is the noted actress uh, Helena Bonham Carter, who was Violet's granddaughter. Helena Bonham Carter is the great granddaughter of um, uh, of H. H. Asquith. Anyway, so, so Violet Bonham Carter was very prominent in liberal circles at this time, and women had the right to vote from 1918, not quite on equal footing with men until 1928, because the people said they wouldn't want flappers, as in these um, unserious minded young women voting. But from 1928, they um, had the vote um, on an equal basis with the male sex. Um, so they're the fair sex, and we are the unfair sex. Chap having some animated conversation on his on his Bluetooth. Um, so enough about the Ishmaelite. Back to Violet Bonham Carter. 
so she attended many liberal meetings, was um, head of the Women's Liberal Federation, and in the 1930s um, was known for her vociferation against appeasement. That's to say, the United Kingdom saying we ought to make concessions to uh, the Third Reich, and then the German government will behave uh, more reasonably. Uh, obviously, that, that ended in tears. As Churchill had said, we had to choose between dishonor and shame. We chose, uh, sorry, dishonor and war. We chose dishonor, but we'll get uh, war. Um, because she thought that um, fascism was completely unacceptable. But wouldn't that be interfering in another state's uh, internal affairs? Now I know. Obviously, the Third Reich had annexed um, uh, much of Czechoslovakia and Poland. But uh, if they have their Nazi system, really, isn't, isn't that up to them? I know the Nazis didn't come to power and maintain it by completely fair and legal means. But the United Kingdom is not going to go and focus those into the um, domestic affairs of other sovereign states it would be intolerable for, for Germany to do so to the UK. I never attempted to do so at the time. But anyway, she was, she was dead against appeasement. But uh, one of the, one of the um, numerous contradictions here uh, was then, in, in order to, to win that war, the United Kingdom had to cozy up to um, a vicious totalitarian regime almost as murderous as the Third Reich. I speak, of course, of the, of the Soviet Union. Anyway, so the Second World War ended and she stood for Parliament um, in Wales. She narrowly lost that. Um, uh, I think that's Wiltshire, uh, in Old Wales Cathedral. So um, her, her old charm, Winter Churchill, made sure that no Conservatives stood against her. It was a straight Liberal Labour fight, and she lost. So the Liberals, they'd been displaced by Labour as a second major party in 1922. There were other factors. Um, yeah, the Liberals didn't represent a class, the Labour was thought to represent the working class, the majority of people, Conservatives represent the middle class, but at least a third of the working class voted Conservative. Without a lot of working class Tories, the Conservatives wouldn't have had a prayer. Not every middle class person voted Conservative. Of course, some working class people didn't bother to vote at all. The, the, the poorer you are, the less educated you are, they usually go together, the less likely you are to cast a ballot at all. Um, that's why some people like Lord Kinnock of Labour, he thought there ought to be compulsory voting. She stood again in 1951 somewhere else, Colnbrook, but again lost. So the Liberals were becoming an electoral irrelevance, winning only 12 seats in 1945, only nine seats in 1950, only six seats in 1951. Um, that's out of roughly 650 seats in the House of, House of Commons, so being reduced about 2% of the vote. Um, so the party was cash-strapped. Um, big business vote, uh, denoting to the Conservative and Unionist Party, trades unions denoting to the Labour Party, and they didn't, they didn't represent an economic interest of the Liberal Party. What they wanted to achieve had largely been, um, largely been accomplished, such as um, you know, the disestablishment of, of the Church of England and Wales, or there were some restrictions on the consumption of alcohol. I can't think what, what else they want. You know, the vote for um, all adults, decolonization was starting. They weren't that big on that as Labour, and on and on. Um, uh, anything else we, uh, about her? So she was president of the Liberal Party, 1945 to 47. Uh, so she remained uh, eminent within liberal circles. Uh, she was a, pro uh, a protege of hers was was a Jeremy Thorpe. Um, uh, anyway, so that is her, and um, her son indeed stood to be a liberal several times, but didn't make it. In the early 60s, we, we hereditary peerages were granted to women for the first time. So uh, sorry, not hereditary peerages, life peerages. So ennobling her, making her. Baroness Bonham Carter of Yarnbury. Yarnbury is a town in Wiltshire. I'm not sure what a connection with that place is. Um, uh, so you hold that, hold that title for life. It was not to be passed on to any of her children when she died, but she had the right to go and sit and vote in the House of Lords. So they'd allowed um, hereditary peers to disclaim their peerages because of um, the, uh, the hereditary nobleman, the third Viscount Stansgate, known by the alias Tony Benn, a Labour MP. He was a Labour MP for a Bristol constituency. Then his um, father died, and he inherited the title. No, sorry, it's the second Viscount Stansgate. And um, he uh, wasn't allowed to be a Labour MP, well, an MP at all. He stood again for his constituency. He got the most votes, but the judge said, no, 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 you're a hereditary peer. You can't be in, in, in the House of Commons. He went to the Commons to attempt to take his seat and was stopped by the police. So another by-election, another by-election kept being re-elected. Eventually, the law was changed, allowing him to disclaim the hereditary title. He thought hereditary titles were complete bunkum and completely um, against equality. But as part of this law, to allow them to um, renounce the hereditary titles, they couldn't pass it to other members of the family. It died. If you renounce it, it renounced forever for all members of your family. They, did, they, they allowed women to be um, ennobled in their own right, not simply to be a noble woman on the grounds that she's married to, uh, to a peer. 
I know a woman who's the daughter of an earl or something could have the title lady, but she couldn't pass on. That wouldn't put her in the House of Lords. So she was in the House of Lords, um, and she died only about five years after she was ennobled. She's not she's not buried in London. I can't remember where she's buried. Um, so she wrote memoirs of of her. Um, close relationship with Winston Churchill, published him just after his death. Um, so these are some very colourful and scintillating vignette, although some would say they're tart gossip. The Churchill family wasn't entirely happy about this. Remember his wife Clementine survived it by 10 years. Notably Clementine Churchill, she was she was cremated at Putney Vale Cemetery. She's not interred beside her spouse um, at uh, Bladen, just, just a mile from, from Blenheim Palace where, where Churchill was born in Oxfordshire. Curious that. Anyway, maybe they had, maybe their marriage was strained towards the end, um, and uh, she was a, a prolific a diarist. Her journals were published later on, giving a very intimate account of what was happening in high political circles in this country from the First World War right through to the 1950s. That's enough about Lady Violet Bonham Carter. Toodaloo.